these three Sundays, we have been in a series on prayer, and we first looked at the theme, Why Pray? And then last week, we looked at the subject, How to Pray Every Day. And uh, today, I want to look at the theme with you of unanswered prayer. Now, I don't think that everything that could be said about unanswered prayer can be said within the time frame we have, and I'm not sure that even if we had more time, everything could be said, because I don't know everything on that subject. I heard a beautiful little story this uh, last Friday night that was told by Ray Rachels, our new assistant district superintendent of the Southern California Assemblies of God. He related the account of this brilliant scientist, nuclear physicist, who was asked to go on a lecture tour of American universities. And the people that were setting up the tour had invited him, but the professor didn't want to go unless they could provide proper help. And among the things that he wanted was a chauffeur, so he didn't have to worry about getting to where he should be and being on time. So they agreed to provide a chauffeur. And the chauffeur would drive him to the meeting. He would come in and sit in the back, listen to the lecture. And this had gone on for about 10, 11, or 12 lectures. And one evening going home, the chauffeur said to the brilliant scientist, you know, I've listened to your lecture now for 10, 11 times, and it's brilliant, and it's so clear. In fact, he said, I think now I've learned it well enough, I could give it myself. And the scientist said, well, that's a great idea. Why don't the next university we go to, we trade places? And I'll wear the chauffeur uniform, and you wear my suit, and you be the scientist. They don't know me from you anyway. Let's do it. So they got to the next university, and that night the chauffeur wearing the business suit strode to the Rostrum met the university president and then was introduced as the scientist. He stood up to speak and sure enough he knew that speech without missing a lick and gave a scintillating, sparkling performance. When he sat down the place erupted in a thunderous ovation and the university president strode to the rostrum, thanked him for his brilliant speech and said at our university it is a custom that when a guest lecture has finished we provide an opportunity for questions and answers so perhaps someone will have a question to ask our distinguished guest this evening a young student stood up and asked a question the vocabulary and uh, the depth of which flew right over the head of the so the chauffeur playing scientist and he was sitting there listening to the question, wondering how he could deal with it, when suddenly a brilliant idea flashed across his mind, and when the student was done, he proceeded to say, well, that is such a simple question that practically everyone would know the answer to. Why, even my chauffeur sitting back there would know the answer to that question. <laughs> so if there are any chauffeurs here today, <clears throat> I'll be happy to let you deal with the question, why doesn't God answer prayer? I want to make seven responses today to that question. It's a serious question. I've prayed. God has not answered my prayer. The first response I'm going to make will sound like a cliché. It is a cliché, but it is true. And I'll just simply give it to you without interpretation. I'm not going to spend any time on it at all. But I think right off the top, if you're answering that question, why doesn't God answer prayer? The first answer has to be, from the scripture, this principle emerges, God does answer all prayer. He says yes, no, and wait. And there therefore is no such thing as an unanswered prayer. He is saying yes, no, or wait. And if he says wait, he's working out a more perfect plan. Now, there are other things we can say, obviously, and let's go to the second way to answer that question. Why doesn't God answer prayer? And that is, this is sort of a caveat, okay? But this simply says, we may not now or ever on this side of eternity know the answer to that question. So if you come to me and you say, I don't understand why God didn't answer that prayer, I may have to say to you, and I don't either. And what's more, you or I may never know until we see Jesus face to face. I know when we first came here 15 years ago, after arriving, Jules' father was diagnosed as having cancer. And Jules' dad had raised her and her two sisters. Jules was two years old when her dad 
when her mother passed away and her twin sisters were two weeks old. And her father had worked as a laborer at Dan River Cotton Mill all his life at minimum wage. And now he was within just an inch of retirement where he could sort of sit back and enjoy a life which up to that time had so been filled with struggle. Chance to come out and visit his daughter, and his other daughters, and then he has cancer. We prayed for his healing, but within the course of the next few months, he deteriorated in his condition until he died. And Jewel greatly struggled with that because this was her daddy, but not only her daddy, but her mommy and her daddy. She said to me one day very bitterly, I don't understand how God could ever ask me to continue serving him when he doesn't answer a prayer like this. And that's not a time, by the way, for giving someone a lecture on obedience to God. We simply understand that hurts there, and we know that if a person is basically healthy in their life, they'll come back to a position of acceptance and health. But there was no, and there still is no answer to the question of why Jules' daddy died just before he got a chance to retire. The Bible tells us some situations where there was no answer. Like, for example, Acts chapter 12. Two of the top three apostles are imprisoned, James first and then Peter. The church prays. Now, specifically, Acts 12 tells us the church was praying for Peter, but I think we can assume that certainly they were praying for James as well. James was killed. Peter was released. We are never told why James was killed. Never told why a young man, and he would have been a young man, probably in his mid-twenties, why in the prime of his life after having been hand-picked and trained by Jesus for three years, right at the outset, before he could ever preach a sermon or write a letter or anything, he's gone. Not told why. We can look at Acts chapter 7 and see the death of Stephen and say, oh yeah, that makes sense because through Stephen's death, Saul of Tarsus had a goad in his conscience and that brought him to Christ. We can make that connection. But with James, there is no connection. We're simply left to wonder. Cecil Osborne has written, The world is full of people searching for simple answers. Hope is held out that perhaps astrology or transcendental meditation or a new guru or some new religious charismatic leader may provide the simple answer. We're all looking for simple answers. Cecil Osborne says, The longer I live, the more I am willing to come to terms with the inexorable fact that trees and human beings grow slowly. And I think I'd add to that, trees and human beings grow slowly and sometimes answers to questions come slowly. So, those are the first two things I would say. The third response I would give as to why God doesn't answer prayer is that God does not answer yes. Notice now I'm qualifying it. I'm not saying God does not answer prayer. I'm saying God does not answer yes to some prayers because of the law, you'll love this, because of the law of internal contradiction. What do I mean by the law of internal contradiction? That is, when we have prayed one prayer and then turn around later and pray another prayer, which is exactly the opposite of the prayer we prayed earlier. We, we may not be aware of it, but God's aware of it. For example, use an old illustration. Augustine, great fourth century church leader, he, before he became a Christian, was a profligate pagan philosopher, brilliant and sinful and sensual. His mother was a devout believer, and she prayed continually for him that he would be saved. He came to her one day and announced to her that he was moving to Rome. She begged him not to and prayed that he wouldn't move to Rome. But he moved anyway. And while in Rome, he found the Lord. Now, the reason God did not answer Augustine's mother's prayer for him not to go to Rome was because she had been praying that he be saved. And God knew that in order to answer that prayer, he needed to get to Rome. So a law of internal contradiction was at work. I think all of us who are serious about being Christians have prayed a basic prayer in our life, Father, make me more like Jesus. Or as the hymn writer says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And therefore, the Lord takes all of our prayer requests and filters them through that basic desire to make sure there is no contradiction between what we are asking and what we have fundamentally asked first as a believer. 
A fourth reason why God does not answer yes to some, some prayers is the law of external contradiction. That is, two people are praying for the same thing, and God can't say yes to both. What is God going to do when Southern California College basketball team plays Westmont, and both are Christian colleges and are praying for victory? What's he going to do? He's going to answer Westmont's prayer. You all know that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not this year. We had an experience a few weeks ago now when we landed in Israel. On the flight with us was another tour group with the company that, uh, that I have been with. And they had a little bit different itinerary than us. We were going straight up to Jerusalem, and they were going up to Galilee. And I was praying for good weather because it's no fun going over on a tour and having it rain on you. They went up to Galilee and got rained on for two solid days. When we went up to Galilee, we had beautiful weather. I commented to, my, to our tour guide that uh, we'd been praying that there wouldn't be rain. And I thought, foolishly, I'm sure they were praying the same thing. She said to me, well, the farmers in Galilee have been praying for rain because it's a drought right now. She showed us the water level of the lake. We desperately need rain. We don't want it to rain on the tour, but the farmers need rain. So my prayer for no rain was in direct contradiction with farmers who needed rain. Which was God going to answer? Why, if he answered my prayer. <laughs> but I really wonder if some things like that aren't God chooses to let natural forces work their way without it tampering with the processes. Praying for someone else's salvation is much like that. Without prayer, we won't see people coming to the Lord. But because we are praying does not mean that God is going to overpower their own free will. A fifth reason God may not answer yes to prayers is uh, what I call his respect for the law of cause and effect. How do I illustrate that? Suppose I get up in the morning and I get down by my bed and I fold my hands and I look up to heaven and I say, Oh Lord, please today make me a millionaire. Suppose I've ruled out playing the California lottery so that there's no prospect of that happening through lottery. God simply is not going to send the guy in the TV program a few years ago that walked around with an envelope and said, here, here's a check. You know, somebody's taken an interest in you and made you a millionaire. The Lord just almost all the time doesn't work that way because making money is a part of investment and hard work. And it just doesn't get dumped on you overnight. If it's dumped on you overnight, often you don't know what to do with it or how to work with it. So God respects the kind of law and cause and effect, law of cause and effect. Uh, some other examples of that, like going to the airport and not being sure which plane the person is on that you're going to meet. And so a plane pulls up at the offloading area and you say, oh Lord, let him please be on this flight. If the flight had left from New York City and if that person didn't get on the flight when it left, you can pray all you want, but they're not going to walk off that plane. <laughs> it's love, cause and effect is in motion. I have not known God lately to fly people from New York to Los Angeles without sitting in an airplane. <laughs> one of our parishioners came to me after hearing this message earlier and said, I got a good one for you. Whenever we're on a trip, he said, I've had this happen out in the desert. I was running low on gas one time and ahead of us was a long stretch of road and then a hill and we couldn't see over the hill. And my wife prayed, oh Lord, please help there to be a gas station on the other side of the hill. <laughs> Well, now, if that gas station wasn't there, God isn't all of a sudden going to create it there, okay? Although one time, I did pray that my gasoline would last longer. I had a 54 Pontiac, and I was in seminary and broke. I'd get a, a dollar in gasoline and drive the freeways on that, and would you believe that particular month I got 30 miles a gallon, whereas the car normally only got 16. So that was rare. But normally, the gasoline station is not created on the other side of the hill, okay? I'm reminded of the Bible teacher who prayed for Mussolini to be raised from the dead. This was shortly after World War II, and the reason why he was praying for Mussolini to be raised from the dead was that he had a theory that Mussolini was the Antichrist, and he hated to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, Mussolini was dead and gone. The law of cause and effect had taken over. The Bible tells us that because of the entrance of sin into the world, the judgment of death is passed to all. So we could pray 
all we wanted to, that God would give us everlasting life in this flesh on earth, but he's not going to do it because the law of cause and effect is in motion and there is a time for us all unless Christ comes for us. Now, a sixth reason God may not say yes to some prayers is that they are outside of his will. And there are really two aspects of that that we need to look at. Some prayers are outside of his will because we're outside of his will when we ask them. And some prayers are outside of his will because God has other intentions than saying yes to the prayer. Let's look for a moment about how we can be outside of his will. For example, unconfessed sin in our life. Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he, may, he will not hear. In family relationships, sin can hinder our prayers so that Paul says, uh, or Peter writing uh, says, Husbands, 1 Peter 3, 7, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. That is, nothing will cut, that's the literal meaning of hinder, nothing will cut off your prayers. Live considerately with your wife. And that'll mess up a lot of prayers right away, won't it, if we're not? And by the way, I think that cuts both ways. Wives, live considerately with your husbands. We had the funniest thing happened to our family a few days ago where I thought of this scripture. Uh, we were scheduled to leave early in the morning to go down to Imperial where I was speaking in an early morning meeting and it's a three and a half hour drive down there. So we were going to get up at 5.30 so we could have, or actually be on the way at 5.30 so we could have breakfast on the road. But the previous night, somehow Jewel saw my wallet sitting out there and decided to go through it. And most guys that I, that I know, anyway, I've done a poll since then. They're, they're, you know, it's sort of like some things are personal, even though there isn't anything in there that I don't mind her seeing at all, but it's just, I don't like her cleaning it, okay? <laughs> and uh, saying, oh, there's a card, you've had that card, you haven't used that in years, let's put that somewhere else, you know? And taking money out, you know, all that kind of thing. And uh, so I said, please don't go through my wallet. I said, I don't go through your purse and throw out things. There might be an important paper there, like my draft registration card, which I've carried all these years, <laughs> and uh, sort of have a hard time letting things go. And uh, please don't do that, but she went ahead anyway. And the next morning we got up, and as we were getting ready to go, I reached for my wallet, and it was gone. I said, Where, what'd you do with my wallet last night? She said, it should be right where you always put it. I said, it's not there. I said, oh, it's got to be around there somewhere. We started looking. One hour later, we were still looking. It was 6.30, and I had to go or I'd be late. I wouldn't be able to speak. As we're going out the door without my wallet, we found it, by the way, three days later in a shoebox in the closet. <laughs> but as we're going out the door, Jewel is very upset with herself, with me for pouring it on about this is a judgment of God for you not listening to me. <laughs> And, she, and she's also a little piqued at God. And she says to me, I prayed to the Lord that he would help me find that wallet, and he hasn't. And I thought of the law of cause and effect in 1 Peter 3, 7. Lest your prayers be hindered. And uh, <laughs> I lost some of my sanctification in that process, too, and needed to get that all taken care of, lest my prayers be hindered. We need to, you know, the scripture has this thing about telling us if we live with sin in our life or if we live with lack of forgiveness in our life, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 21 through 23, our prayers are hindered. Our prayers can also be out of the will of God if they're asked without faith. That's why James tells us, chapter 5, verse 15, that when we pray for the sick, it's the prayer of faith. Not saying automatically that every sick person will always be healed, but there is no healing, no fervent prayer unless it's accompanied by faith. And wrong motives can keep us from being out of God's will or keep us from being in God's will. When you ask, James says, chapter 4, verse 3, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on uh, what you get on your pleasures. Hypocrisy can also be a cause 
of the Lord answering no to our prayers, God wouldn't even listen to the Pharisee who stood with pride and heard the humble man, the publican, who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. All praying is to be in Christ's name, John 14, 13. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And that asking in Jesus' name is something far more than enunciating Jesus' name at the end of a prayer and say, oh, yes, lest we forget, Jesus, this is in your name. For asking in the name of the Lord means to ask in such a way that the character of Christ stands behind it and endorses fully our request. So sometimes a prayer is not answered because it's out of God's will and we're the ones that are out of God's will. Sinful, and we're selfish, we're unforgiving, we're not asking in Christ's name, we're not asking with faith. And then sometimes God may have other purposes in mind than saying yes to our prayer and we may be all okay, squared around, but God has something different in mind. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 who pray this beautiful prayer, Lord, deliver us from this fiery furnace, but if not, we're going to serve you anyway. God chose not to deliver them from the furnace, but to deliver them in the furnace. Paul has a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. And the Greek word is so strong, it reflects a stake that is pressing into the body, a sharp pronged point. Someone has said Paul had a migraine headache, and that's what his thorn in the flesh was. But as a matter of fact, Paul never tells us what the thorn was, and I think the Holy Spirit had him deliberately not tell us because we all have thorns. And so he didn't want it to be locked in on one thing, but let it to be representative of any thorn which presses against us, which we ask God to remove, and he doesn't. And Paul prayed just like Jesus. Remember three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked, remove this cup? So Paul says, if Jesus can pray that way, I can pray that way. Three times I specifically sought the Lord on this, and he chose to say to me, my grace is sufficient for you. That is, he's saying to Paul, I am not going to give you at this moment what you ask, but what I am going to give you is myself, and you will find that is enough. So if God doesn't give us what we specifically ask, he will give us himself, which we will find to be enough. And then, too, sometimes we're praying a prayer, and God does not intend to say immediately a yes, nor does he intend to say no, but there are some processes that need to be perfected. So he says, wait. And Paul has that experience in Romans chapter 1, where he is praying that in God's will he might go to Rome, to the end that he might strengthen the Roman believers and impart to them some spiritual gift. But after writing that letter from Corinth, instead of heading west to Rome, he heads east, finds himself in Jerusalem a few months later, is arrested, held as a prisoner in Palestine for two years, is sent on a prison ship to Rome, shipwrecks in the Mediterranean, washes up stranded on an island for the winter. Finally, some three years or more after writing the Roman letter, he winds up in Rome, getting there in a much different way than he thought he would when he prayed that in God's will he might get there. What's the Lord have in mind? Paul arrives in Rome in 61 AD. The Lord knows that Nero is going to turn against the church in 64 AD and a horrible holocaust is going to break out against God's people. Who's going to strengthen them in that time with their own personal example that God can be with us in tragedy and in fire and in loss? It's going to be Paul. Out of his heart is going to come the Philippian and Philemon and Colossian and Ephesian letter, letters written from that prison experience. And Paul, through those letters, is going to be saying, God is with us in adversity. Difficult times do not necessarily mean God has abandoned us. No, quite the reverse. God is with us. Persevere. Go on. If it hadn't been for that delay in Paul's travel plans, that delay in his answer to prayer, he would have never had that choice lesson to communicate to the Roman church, which wound up strengthening them and giving them a special gift. Those that say delays or that the thorn in the flesh were because Paul had sin in his life or didn't have faith are my understanding exceedingly close to blaspheming the spirit who caused the scripture to be written and the authenticity and validity of the experience which an apostle such as Paul shares. You know, there are t a couple of times in the Bible where God answers a prayer, yes, when he didn't want to answer it that way, when it was outside of his will to say yes. 
And that leads me to sort of a little conclusion that it is better for God to answer no in his will than to say yes outside of his will. The two times are when Israel in the wilderness asks for meat instead of manna. They're tired of manna. And God sends them meat. But Psalm 116 verse 15 tells us that he gave them their request but sent leanness into their own soul. It's like the prodigal son. The father granted his request, but he got leanness in his soul. And then another occasion was Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. The Lord said to Hezekiah, you're going to die, Hezekiah. Set your house in order. And Hezekiah says, God, I don't want to die. Please heal me. He starts praying and negotiating with God, and God gives him 15 more years. Finally, reluctantly, God gives him 15 years. And Hezekiah is happy. But during that 15 years, Hezekiah gives birth to a son named Manasseh, and he shows his wealth to the Babylonians who will later conquer his country. Manasseh becomes the worst king his country ever had, would not have been born had Hezekiah died on time. And nor would the nation have been subjected to Babylon had not Hezekiah been so foolish in those last 15 years. So God said yes, because a person prevailed. And the scripture is there to say, hey, it's okay to prevail, but be careful when you prevail, lest you prevail against God's will. Now, a seventh response we can have to why God doesn't say yes to our prayers is sometimes an answer to prayer may be delayed by a spiritually hindering force. Daniel tells us about that in Daniel 10, a very mystical passage in which he says he prayed, and it took three weeks for an answer to get back to his prayer. Paul says pretty much the same thing in different ways in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we're to pray at all times because we're involved in a struggle and a fight. Now the last thing I would want as a result of this message today is for you to go home and somebody to say to you, what did pastor preach on this morning? You say, oh, he talked to us about why God doesn't answer prayer. <laughs> and then that becomes a downer for you instead of a faith builder. I feel that what I have shared with you is right out of God's book and therefore is all true. But something that's all true may not necessarily promote faith. It may pr promote knowledge, but it doesn't necessarily promote faith. That's why Jesus continually in teaching us on prayer gives us the positives of prayer and teaches us perseverance. Matthew 7, 7, go on asking, go on seeking, go on knocking. Luke 18, 1, where Jesus tells the story of the widow who besought the judge to deal with her, the injustice against her. Jesus told this parable that we should always pray and not give up. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 4 tells us to consider Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary or lose heart in your struggle against sin. You have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And so keep at it. Keep in the struggle. And James tells us, chapter 5, verse 16, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 38, tell us that the people of faith and the people of prayer find on one occasion that God opens prison doors and shuts the mouths of lions and quenches raging fires. And on the other hand, there are times when the people of God are persecuted and hunted down and roam destitute and homeless. And yet, both are praying and both are kept by their faith in God. What do you do when you pray and God does not say yes? Do you quit praying? I know people who are bitter because they prayed a particular way and God didn't say yes. And so they've stopped praying altogether. Some have even stopped serving Christ. How do we respond to that? I think I can close with just this little illustration. A life of prayer to me is like this little dried out stick which I hold in my hand. And when we quit praying, it means that when life's reverses come, we're easily broken by those reverses. But if when the Lord says no, we continue steadfast in our prayer, our life is supple and filled with vitality like this little branch which still has its green within it and it can be bent all the way around but it is not broken and anyone who follows the Lord any length of time knows that there are times when you are bent over 
But as you continue to serve the Lord and to pray, you'll find that there is a vitality in prayer that keeps you from being dried out and broken, but keeps you flexible and used as an instrument in God's hands. Our Lord, we ask you what your disciples ask you. Teach us to pray. And we take a moment, Lord, to inventory our life and find those occasions in it where we have been deeply disappointed that you have responded the way you have to our prayers. And we bring that now to you. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to see the good that you're working through it all and to help us to be stronger and more powerful people as a result of waiting on you. Let us not neglect, Lord, the ministry of prayer, lest our spirit become dried up and we become broken and tossed away. But let us keep that relationship with you through prayer vital and open and alive, that our life may be nurtured and that in the branches of our life, the good flower and fruit of God's will and work may grow. We give our lives anew to you and ask your blessing through Christ. Amen.